Good morning, and you're all very, very welcome to join us here as we do this current edition of Eurofan's latest Ask the Expert webinar. We're going to be talking about the state of play of social dialogue in Europe today, gathering experts within Eurofan who will be able to partake their wisdom on this topic during the morning and the course of the next hour. Thank you to so many of you for joining us today. I know many of you have signed up to the platform and many of you are following us on our other channels on YouTube and Twitter, etc. My name is Mary McCoy. I'm head of communication here at Eurofound. And our job in Eurofound is to ensure that we disseminate and share the knowledge that we have in all of the areas which relate to social employment, work-related topics on the EU policy agenda. Our job is also to ensure that we facilitate debate on these issues. And today, that's exactly what we're going to do on this particular topic, social dialogue, industrial relations, trends and developments uh, over the course of the last period. We're going to look at the major steps that have got us here, uh, that we are in the current situation that we are today, the major milestones and developments. We're going to look at trends in industrial relations, developments, how we've measured those and what story do they tell us at this very important juncture. For those of you who are in our regular audience, you know you're a fan and you will know what we do. But for those of you who are new, I would ask you to join the chat you can follow us on our social media channels, uh, the various ones that you all know and, and use. Um, please do sign up, hashtag uh, Eurofound Live, hashtag Eurofound uh, Ask the Expert, and uh, hashtag Social Dialogue in this particular case. We will be also channeling your questions. We have a series of our colleagues who are online, hoping that you will engage and participate in today's discussion. It is an interactive discussion, and so we are looking forward to your questions, and we will filter them in and factor them into the discussion ongoing, and uh, we hope that you will participate as part of the discussion during the next hour. Um, so to get to the point of this morning, uh, our discussion today is set against the context of, we hope, the much-anticipated uh, Val Duchesse II, which will be taking place in 2024, according to Commission President uh, Ursula von der Leyen, who announced this back in September of uh, 2023. Um, we are going to, I hope, set the scene in terms of where we are today. What have we found out in terms of our research findings? What do we know about the state of play, both in terms of social, social dialogue, industrial relation trends and indicators? We're going to focus on the latest research, research findings from Eurofound, and we're going to discuss them together with two um, of our experts in this area. And indeed, I will introduce them to you now. Uh, one expert I'm sure many of you know uh, on my right here is Christian Wels. Christian has worked in this area for many, many years. And in fact, we have uh, Christian on loan. Um, at the moment, because he has just left Eurofound, uh, retired, in fact, just last month, uh, uh, correct, yes. you, you left us. And in fact, <clears throat> as he left, he signed off on the report that we're going to talk about today. On my left here, I also have another expert in this particular area, who is Ricardo Rodriguez Contreras. And uh, uh, Ricardo also works in the Working Life Unit, uh, which was the unit that uh, Christian also was part of while he was with us. So we're going to get the ball uh, rolling today, and I'm going to start off with really asking Ricardo, in this case, if you just give us a, a sort of an outline of, of the developments, of, of the state of play. You've done an awful lot of work in this area. Eurofund has been active in this area from the start. In fact, it's a core element of our, our mandate to carry out uh, work in this area. But can you outline really, just to set the scene, what are the main developments, what are the major milestones that have got us to where we are today? Thank you, Mary. Good morning. Uh, well, that's... Um, no big task. <laughs> <laughs> no, not a big task, but a very, very short time. So I, just to, to mention uh, well, where we are now, we need to, to, to make some kind of a short story of what social dialogue at European level, in the social dialogue in the European Union, basically. Uh, and as you mentioned before, we should start by the original mm -hmm. Bandishes, uh, which was take play, take, took, took place in 19... 
85, and in this first period of the history of social dialogue, uh, was really a very seminal period, and the social partners were able to uh, to be part of the construction of Europe. Basically, that, that's the main point, because the, this this first period uh, also the outcomes of these conversations and of this social dialogue was uh, embodied in the Maastricht in the Treaty in 1991. Uh, and during the following years, uh, we we saw a lot of developments in terms of uh, social uh, and labor aspects uh, for the in, at the European Union level. Um, so we could say that social dialogue at that time mm. became part of the European social model, integrated, integrated yeah. there. And then that's a, a major achievement, basically. And this is uh, something that we should not uh, uh, forget at any time. In this first period, so social era was very important, was remarkable. I have to remember that at that time we will talk about the European Monetary Union, the Euro, the things that probably mm. sometimes we have forgotten, but it's very, very important. And the outcomes of this social dialogue, bilateral and tripartite social dialogue, was, were very, very important in order to, to shape where we are now. Then we have, uh, as part of the construction of the European Union, the enlargement and during this first period of time. Also, we saw the the, uh, the establishment of the uh, sectoral social dialogue, the European sectoral social dialogue, and the first uh, European uh, sectoral social committees. Uh, and they were producing a lot of um, common opinions, uh, guidelines, orientations, also, also a relevant part of the European social dialogue. Um, with enlargement, uh, we see also we so saw the, the importance of this uh, conversation, of this social dialogue in order to shape the social model in the, in the new countries at that time. Then, after that, we had a complicated period, to say the least. First of all, because uh, we had the financial crisis in 2008, and that was really a, a, an important element in terms of uh, putting pressure on, on member states, on governments, uh, of course, in the social economy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then during this period, we we saw uh, some uh, problems and issues, and even uh, some um, deterioration in terms of social dialogue in some countries uh, because of the uh, basically you know, the, the so-called austerity policies, mm -hmm. basically strict financial rules, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this period was. Uh, uh, really uh, difficult, complicated for social dialogue, for bipartisan social dialogue, for tripartite social dialogue, even for a uh, European social dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, then we had this recovery period mm -hmm. after the financial crisis, we could say about uh, 2011, more or less, starting or 2012, because we had to, to yeah. uh, the, the first financial crisis and then the, uh, the Great Recession, as we call it. Um, and then this recovery period, again, we see more or less a, a recovery of the social dialogue as such. Um, in fact, in 2015, 2016, with the new um, period, the new term of the Commission, the Juncker Commission, we saw the, the very important uh, step in terms of the, um, the, the, new, the restart of the new uh, of the social dialogue. Uh, it was um, a major achievement, the European Pillar of Social Rights, the agreement in order to, to, uh, to start this, uh, this period that was signed by the European Social Partners and by the Commission and by the Council, by the way. So, and this started really, restarted uh, a new period, in, a fruitful period for social dialogue. Um, then at that time, where there were some developments, uh, and then we had the, the where mm. we are now, basically mm. after mm. after over the in the last year, we have seen of of course has been the very strong impact of the pandemic in 2020, uh, and then we we saw that the social dialogue was contributing a lot in order to shape to to mitigate the impact of social dialogue it was really a very exemplary reaction at all levels of social mm. dialogue at national level, sectoral level, at company level too. And this uh, also shows the, the value of social dialogue in order not only to mitigate, but also to shape the possibilities uh, to, for, for progress. And then, unfortunately, mm -hmm. since then, we okay. have had another yeah. crisis yeah. and another crisis. Time so crisis, we are jumping yeah. from crisis yeah. to another crisis. Yeah. But uh, in, in all of them, uh, we see that also the 
social dialogue, a tripartite label, basically, it's a very important instrument and tool in order not only to mitigate or to, to cushion the, the, the impact of this crisis, but also in order to, to be able to, to contribute to govern the, the huge challenges that we, we have now. So this is where we are now. And then, as you said at the beginning, we have this uh, re-edition of the Valdichez, uh, which will take place in, in 2024. Uh, that's we don't know anything about the content. Of course, it's not our role to say what will be there. But at least to have this meeting, this summit well, uh, on at the European agenda. level on the agenda, it's a very important step again because this shows a political willingness to recognize the importance of social dialogue. Because there, are, of course, as we know very well, and we will talk about this later, all the challenges that are mm -hmm. taking place for the European economy because of the crisis, the international crisis, the geopolitical crisis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, only the announcement is really a very good news for society. It's a good positive message, even in, in the announcement. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. absolutely. And in terms of, you talked there about fruitful mm -hmm. uh, dialogue, you know, about the periods that were positive. Uh, what, what, do we know what constitutes good social dialogue? Is, yeah, <laughs> another easy well, question. Uh, yeah, well, not, it's relatively easy. So uh, first, in a very simple way, uh, we have a good social dialogue if we have uh, a good agreement in the end, so a good outcome. So the, the, the ideally social dialogue is uh, should be able to deliver something, something positive for, for the signatory party, but also for the society as such. This is the, 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 the basic res the response. Of course, if we go a deep in, uh, in that, uh, um, we should get ideally, ideally, uh, what are the enabling conditions for a good social dialogue? Mm -hmm. And this is uh, something important. Uh, well, first of all, uh, we need uh, strong actors. Mm -hmm. Strong actors meaning uh, those actors that on the ground, business organizations, trade unions. If we talk about uh, tripartite social dialogue at national level, at least, we need also governments uh, uh, willing to engage social dialogue. Mm -hmm. We need an agenda, so we need to define the, the scope of what is at stake, what would, what would be needed to be discussed. Um, we also uh, need some solid grounds, meaning social dialogue frameworks. And this, this is something that is very, very different across member states. We know it for a long, long time ago. So some member states, that they have different traditions. And of course, they have different um, grounds in terms of uh, practices, in terms of settings. Some countries, uh, they have their own tripartite um, bodies in order to discuss uh, the social and labor developments. Other countries not. Uh, but it doesn't matter. So in the end, you, you should do the way in which this can be done in a, in a, in a smooth way. Um, of course, <coughs> something that is more and more important because um, in these turbulent times, we have uh, more and more problems, which are more complicated, more complex. We need some kind of uh, at least capacity, mm -hmm. means technical capacity, because uh, now, uh, I don't know, for example, about digitalization issues, climate change issues, we yeah. need to discuss these topics. We need some kind of, of, of um, relevant knowledge in order to talk what it's about. But basically, uh, to get a uh, meaningful um, timely, because it's also important to, sure. to give time yeah. for exchange, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, social dialogue, uh, basically what we need willing to engage. Mm -hmm. And if we talk about bipartite social dialogue, uh, trust, some kind mm -hmm. of trust. So, I mean, this is also very important uh, in this ideal terms. But of course, uh, um, each country, each um, industrial assistance, as we talk about later, they have their own um, grounds, different and important thing is that in the end, social partners are represented uh, and they're able to, to, to produce an exchange uh, at any level. Okay. Interesting, the trust issue, it permeates <laughs> everything we talk about at the moment uh, across so many issues. And I suppose, Christian, uh, turning to you on, on this, um, Ricardo has given a very good and broad overview of, of the milestones and where we are and what the situation is today in terms of uh, what is playing out. 
uh, I suppose that if we dig a little bit deeper and, and we look at uh, what you were researching before you, you left us, um, we carried out this research and in fact you published a report just before leaving on mm -hmm. measuring key dimensions of industrial relations and industrial democracy. And there I suppose you can flesh this out a little bit for us. I mean, we're looking there at the quality and performance of industrial relations across Europe. And what, what, what do we see uh, when, when you've looked at that? But, but also, you know, how do we measure this? Uh, can you outline a little bit that so we can dig a little bit deeper into it? Thank you very much, Rajuta. And thank you for the uh, diverse approach of including even pensioners <laughs> within this panel. Um, trying to measure industrial relations is not an easy task and for different reasons. But one reason would be that our colleagues of the other units, they all have surveys and there is no pan-European industrial relations survey. So you have to make some makeshift arrangements if you want to measure quality. And then whenever you measure quality, of course, it's a very normative approach. What does quality mean? So for this to happen for the first time, we needed a conceptual framework. And having a conceptual framework is not easy once you're in academia, but having a conceptual framework once you work for a tripartite institution, it's even more complicated. Yeah. But finally, we arrived at our conceptual framework which was actually, which drew on a, a very book I could, I could recommend by John W. Budd. It's called Employment with a Human Face. And John Budd, American scholar from uh, Minnesota, said, every good system of industrial relations should try to combine three things, efficiency, equity, and voice. Mm -hmm. So we built on this, it was a good starting point. We used some more European than American terms for that. So voice became for us industrial democracy, okay. a very, very old concept going back to the 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, there was the, one of the first IR books written by a famous couple, Beatrice and Sidney Webb, actually the first, the only couple writing on it, and probably one of the first female IR scholars for a long time. And they wrote about industrial democracy. So we pulled this in. And the, then what should the system deliver? It should deliver good working conditions, of course, quality of working quality. for us. It should deliver competitiveness mm -hmm. for the companies, for the employers, and of course, social justice. So that was our starting point, mm -hmm. having this conceptual framework agreed by our tripartite constituents. And then um, I was quite happy and I would have stopped there, but then uh, our director at the time came and said, Christian, can we measure that? I said, oh my God, mm -hmm. how shall we go about it? But thankfully, in, now in the second report, we are able to measure that on the basis of 47 indicators, 13 only on the sub-dimensions which we call industrial democracy, being all the processes that employers and trade unions use to govern the employment relationship. We were the first one to include the employers in there. Okay. So we have those indicators, and by means of this, these indicators, we can now say confidently, with all the caveats there are about um, Comps and indicators, uh, clustering, sure, et cetera, yeah, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. But I think we were among the first to do this, and we are now having the second edition of that. And before I forget it, I would like to thank our contractors, Notus, Maria Caprile, and Pablo Sanz, who did these studies for us. Uh, it was a great cooperation, and uh, we hope, wouldn't have been able to do this without them. Okay. But in terms of what you found, in terms of when you looked at that and you took this sort of uh, voice industrial democracy uh, approach and established the framework, what kind of trends did you see? Uh, you know, have you seen an evolution over time in terms of industrial relations systems? Uh, you know, are we seeing particular, I suppose, storylines emerging across the different member states? Uh, I think I have to disappoint you. Oh. <laughs> That's unfortunate. There are, no, there are no definite trends, especially over the time period we measured, 2008 <clears throat> until 2021. Ricardo mentioned all the ups and downs, that, mm. which also happened in IR. But uh, there are no really very definite trends. Yet, uh, we still have, and over the time, we still have a very polarized picture when it comes to industrial democracy. Mm -hmm. So we have a small group, which would be at the top of the league table, the usual suspects, and then we have some new average, and then we would have the countries which are below it. So who would be at the top? Uh, I can name them to you, of course, uh, the Scandinavian countries, Sweden, Denmark, Netherlands, Central Europe, Austria, Finland, Luxembourg, Germany, France, Belgium, Slovenia. 
the only new member state mm. being on top of it. That's yeah. quite quite interesting, yeah. isn't it? And then we have, oh, sorry, I'm wrong. And then we have Czechia and Croatia as well. Okay. So three, the... which is not a bad development, actually, because when they joined, they were not as performing as they're now. And then at the at the other end, we would have two, uh, three old member states, Italy, Portugal, and Greece, not <clears> performing so well underneath the EU average. And unfortunately, at the very end, we would have uh, Latvia and Hungary. So... Um, they are not very definitive trends. They're quite stable, um, but yeah, it's okay. Nothing absolutely nothing clear absolutely about clear over the last. But okay. again, but it was very very troubling times, and we'll mm. speak about the financial crisis maybe later. Yeah, which did a, had a big impact on industrial relations, mm. also on industrial relations. So yeah. But can we see that there is a convergence, an upward convergence, or or are you seeing divergence in this? Even they're not clear trends. Again, uh, the trends are very complicated, and I, I would like to, to thank our colleagues, uh, Massey and his team, for um, pointing this to us, because in the previous report, we hadn't imported, um, included the issue of uh, or the concepts of, of divergence and convergence. So we, every ha we, again, we would have three different periods. We would have the period from 2008 to 13, where we would have uh, downward divergence mm -hmm. because of the crisis. Then we would have the period from 2018, the recent one, uh, to 13, where we'd have, and that's quite um, quite um, interesting, we would have uh, some upward convergence because okay. everything's yeah. going better. But when you take it over the long time from 2018, again, that's not a very <clears throat> clear picture. Maybe some upward convergence, but because of those two conflicting trends, we are having this. So when you go to the member state levels, uh, we would have nine member states which are converging. First of all, there's the group that is catching up, catching up to the European I mean, Bulgaria, Estonia, Luxembourg, Lithuania, Poland, Portugal. Um, then you have the group um, which are, were mm -hmm. the outperformers in the past and still are, Denmark, Netherlands, and Slovenia, Scandinavian countries. Yeah. They are still growing, but at a slower pace. So in a way, okay. they're, they're converging. Yeah. And then, of course, you have those six member states, which are still diverging. Um, Austria, Finland, um, Luxembourg, and, and Sweden. And again, this question of outperforming mm -hmm. uh, above the European average. And then, unfortunately, you have two countries which are still further declining, and those are Hungary and Malta. So you see, it's it's mm -hmm. not an easy picture, no. but it's, it's not an easy topic, and uh, that's what... That's what yeah, but you about. did mention there the... the the financial crisis mm -hmm. and I mean also Ricardo mentioned that also in terms of the impact it had on, on social dialogue but when you looked at this in your research because I think that was included as part of the research that you carried out the impact of the financial crisis in terms of how it affected industrial relations and um, what did you find there? It wasn't a part of this very the, report but it was other, part of yeah. the previous uh, process but implicitly as I mentioned it also has, um, has impacts on the issue of conversion and divergence um, I would argue, we would argue that the, the financial crisis probably was the worst thing that happened to industrial relations uh, for a long period of time. Uh, what happened? Uh, well, the overall picture is a decentralization of collective bargaining uh, by different means, more opt-out and opening clauses, uh, less extension procedures, uh, less continuation of, upon expiry, um, the weakening of the so-called favorability principle. So it really had strong negative impact on industrial <clears throat> systems, even in those countries which put in mature industrial relations. Uh, but luckily we've recovered from that. And uh, I don't know whether we can agree, hope so. I think the next two crises were handled in a better way, more inclusive, more with more support from the social partners. So, but again, it was a, it was a dividing, uh, dividing decisive moment for industrial relations in Europe, the financial crisis. I mean, apart from the very sort of simple answers that I could imagine I could uh, apply to that. Are there, are there reasons that you can see that come into play, this sort of pressure that is brought to bear on industrial relations in a time of crisis like this? Is it, is it clear what those drivers are? Well, that's a very political and difficult question to answer now. Uh, well, the mainstream at that time was um, governments and other institutions, some other institutions, thinking that by 
liberalizing those relations by decentra decentralizing uh, collective bargaining, one could and would make the systems more competitive. Mm. But in hindsight, I think many would agree that this wasn't the case and it probably was the, <clears throat> the wrong move at the time. Mm. So, I mean, you would hope lessons learned. So perhaps, Ricardo, I mean, on, on the financial crisis side of things, can do you think we can extrapolate what we learned from that and the impact it had on the industrial relations systems, on social dialogue, when we look at the pandemic, when we look at the war in Ukraine, cost of living crisis, et cetera, is it possible for us to, to see how that has affected uh, and how we could learn from that for perhaps future crises? Well, hopefully we don't have this. <laughs> another crisis. So many crises in never a really short never period of time. Him. But basically, as Christian was saying, okay, we, we, what we learned from, from the financial crisis mm. the, during the, the Great Recession was that uh, um, industrial relations and particularly tripartite social was uh, eroded in, in, in some countries uh, uh, because many factors that have been already explained. But certainly we can mention some of them that we have found in this research about the industrial systems in Romania, for example, was a big uh, change. Uh, in Greece, for example, we're having problems in order to measure because over mm -hmm. the over the 15 years so we have been, been measuring, but there had some change in one way or another. So it's, it's these relations are really uh, dynamic. Uh, mm -hmm. Even, of course, if you only look at uh, 15 years, we, you cannot say we cannot find uh, many definitive trends, as Christian said. So what we have learned is that now, or over the past years, the, 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 the pandemic crisis uh, has been much better uh, managed in terms of mm -hmm. social dialogue. Uh, it, it, again, it, it, it shows the, the importance and the high level of contribution that social dialogue can make to not only the, the, the signatory party, not only the company level or uh, the social and labor issues, but also to society as such, mm. even to democracy as such. That, that's a, a very good lesson uh, learned. Um, um, but of course, social dialogue is, is about delivering as much mm. as possible, good delivering, but also it's a process as such. And having a good, uh, uh, a healthy social dialogue, which is stable, which is regular, which is a good quality, mm -hmm. it's very important. Even if you don't get an agreement in the end, mm. that's, that's part of the story. So not everything, not all the not all the stories have a, a final uh, a positive success in the end. So yes, we have learned that uh, social dialogue is important not only because of the big crisis, but also because it's able to promote resilience, mm -hmm. resilience to society, but also be a part of the competitiveness equation. Mm -hmm. So it's able to deliver something in this. In this. And we have. Um, it's quite clear and, and that those countries with solid and good quality social dialogue frameworks and practices and are able to deliver and are the countries that are more competitive in the end. So that's, that's uh, something that... So it has not on knock on, on positive effects. No, yeah, yeah. yeah, and it's not only in our research. I think the mm. ILO also has mm. the, same, the same result, the same, the same evidence. And uh, uh, Christian, in that case, does the research also show you that if you have strong industrial relations systems in place, you know, uh, can we expect other positive effects from that? Have we seen that there is that knock-on effect? Actually, that's a very nice finding, uh, I hope, of our report. Because one thing we did, we did a cluster analysis trying to find a typology for different regimes. There are four which we identified. The first one would be the ID industrial democracy-based cluster. The second one would be the state-centered. The third one would be uh, liberal market clusters. And the last one would be company-based. And the first cluster is the one with the strongest industrial relations, mm. high collective bargaining coverage, high trading density, um, high employer density, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are also the ones I just named in the league table. And then when you look at those six, um, Austria, Denmark, Finland, Germany, Netherlands, and Sweden, those are the six which score the best in our industrial democracy um, <clears throat> dashboard. But they are also uh, the six countries on top of the industrial relations index, the overall index. They're among the seven uh, in terms of in competitors, 
and they're also among the top eight among uh, social justice. So here we could say, um, if you have a good system of industrial democracy and, and uh, industrial relations, you can also have a very competitive economy. Mm -hmm. You can also have a very just economy. Don't get me wrong, there's no causality. It's mm -hmm. just co correlation. correlation. You observe this mm -hmm. and this at the same time. But still, I think it's quite an interesting find that having a good quality system of industrial relations, you are also competitive and social just. Mm -hmm. That's a fascinating finding, actually. It, in terms uh, yeah, of it's, it's, it's quite, quite interesting. Yes. Yeah, and does it go further back to see what kind of countries actually establish those strong industrial relations systems in the first place? What kind of things are in place in those countries that that happens? Well, a bit, a bit like like Ricardo said, and I, I said earlier, the importance, of course, it, it takes uh, in this case three to tango. Uh, you have to have a supportive government, a supportive legal framework. You have to have strong and autonomous social partners. Mm -hmm. You need to have trust, like uh, Ricardo mentioned, and um, finally, you know, also need the capacity to do so. And we've been doing this project for quite a while, capacity building. I think it's a very important thing we should keep up doing because if you don't have the capacity to yeah. engage in collective bargaining, either because you don't have the human, human resources or the financial one, then most of the times the, the government step in. And then you have this imbalance of tripartism with yeah. strong governments and maybe less strong social partners and less autonomous social partners. So building that capacity, building that trust, in fact, or in fact, one feeds into the other a lot of the time. Yeah. Yes, and yeah. making social dialogue also more well known. I mean, if we mm -hmm. stepped out of our door here and asked uh, somebody in Lockenstown what social dialogue, uh, I doubt we would get an answer. That's so one of the reasons we're talking today, isn't it? <laughs> to, to broaden the scope, yeah, spread the message. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I mean, we have some questions coming in, and I'll maybe just factor some of them in at this stage. There's a question from Matthias uh, in Germany. Uh, who's talking specifically here about the rail sector, uh, that they have a very well-functioning sectoral social dialogue with innovative results. Um, they're concerned about the current process of revising social dialogue. And in particular, we consider the planned savings and cost reimbursement, but also the changes need to be difficult. That will have a negative effect on the participation. Uh, what do the Eurofound experts think about the revision process? Now, you know, our job is to provide the research, our job is to give the data and findings, but do you have anything to contribute on that particular one, Ricardo? Well, this is a, a question from Germany. <laughs> so probably Christian is not a place. I think it's a more question. general one, but I will pass it to, to Christian if you have some comment on that. Yes, unfortunately, we haven't done any recent research on that. But at this point, I might, might want to point to our so-called representative studies, mm. by means of which we look into all 44 sectors, Euro European Absolutely. sectors, yeah. social committees, and also the rail sector. And the first one I did many, many years ago was on the rail sector, which is complicated enough. Mm. And I think my colleague Peter Karkovs and uh, the other colleagues involved have, have looked into this again. So we do, we do um, deliver some background information but we wouldn't go into specific problems at national mm -hmm. level because that's beyond our remit. And, uh... Yeah, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, another question, which is one which I'm sure we have all been aware of about the trade union membership. And a question from James here asks, uh, trade union membership is lower among millennials and Generation C um, than other generations. Could this potentially undermine the social dialogue process? Yeah, yeah, indeed, yeah. That, that's, that's quite clear. This is a, a, an issue. I think it's not an issue only for trade unions. It's mm. an issue for social lab. It's an issue for, for everybody in the European Union. Uh, we have seen this um, uh, long tendency and long trend in terms of declining of trade union density, which is the, the technical uh, denomination of that. Uh, we also have seen uh, some small declining in, in employers' organization, but much less uh, dimension. So yes, I think that uh, this is a pending, a pending issue that uh, not only trade unions, uh, 
that need to work on that, the, 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 the disaffection of young people. Of course, there are some reasons for that. So the, the, the fragmentation of labor market, mm. uh, the, the difficulties in order for, for young people to, to get integrated, to be, the fragmentation of the economy, of the business models, for example. This is something that also we have seen over the past uh, decade. So there are many reasons for that, but th these reasons are identified. So and that mm. could be um that could be worked together i think that at this stage uh, also uh, we should mention the the, the, the recent uh, council recommendation uh to strengthen social and national level to what is uh, issued by the by the council in, in june um, 2023 and it's important to mention that it provides some some kind of path for the coming years mm -hmm. in order to strengthen the social dialogue frameworks including collective bargaining not only social dialogue and I think that this even is not a, a legally binding uh, test, but it's a legal text. And also it could put some pressure in some member states in order to really strengthen, to, to reinforce the mechanism, the settings, uh, the practices, the legislation in order to, to facilitate uh, social dialogue. And one part of this will be also to, to promote uh, the uh, affiliation of young mm -hmm. people for different ways. But of course, <clears throat> every country is different. They have, they have their own resources. And indeed, I, I fully agree with this uh, um, person that really is, that's a, is a big issue for not only for trade unions, but also for the society mm -hmm. as such. I go ahead, Jack, on, on this one, um, I'm not here to speak about millennials, but maybe a, more of my generation, the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. um, it was easy for trade unions to organize in the 50s. Let's take Germany, uh, the biggest sector being the metal sector. Mm -hmm. Um, it's easy to, relatively easy to organize a worker who's in the factory from eight to five or even longer, and then you go in there and organize. Uh, this is why uh, the biggest trade union in the world, uh, IG Metall, every process in English, it sounds like a hard rock band, IG Metal. Um, <laughs> I prefer IG Metall. <laughs> so it was easy, but now, like you kind of mentioned, uh, the employment relationship has completely shifted. How do you organize? It's possible, as we've seen, but how do you organize temporary agency workers? Mm -hmm. How do you organize uh, the Ubers and Deliveroo's platform workers? Uh, platform yeah, workers? Yeah. It has become quite quite mm -hmm. difficult for trade unions, and I don't envy um, them for that. Um, so maybe if, if I may, just a short story there. Before I left, we visited some of the American companies here in based mm -hmm. based in, in the Docklands. I, three of them. The tech multinationals who are based in Dublin. Based in Dublin. Yeah. And there was a very uh, nice, intelligent young couple um, presenting the, the company to us. And one of the questions was actually, would you have a works council or what's your view on trade unions? And then they said, ah, oh, we don't need this. We have such a good relationship with our management. And then a few weeks later, we had massive layoffs in some of the companies. Many of them, yeah. So, it's probably a lure to think I'm highly qualified, what many of the millennials are, of course, and I wouldn't need a trade union. So it's a double, it's quite a double edged sword. Mm. And in an age of full employment, relatively yes. speaking, yes. of course, yeah, it also adds to the issue. Um, it, in terms of, it's interesting you responded on that question because one of the questions we got prior to this was about how the new world of work would, would affect and uh, participation in, in trade union membership, but also the social dialogue process itself. Um, there's another question here from Yuka uh, about uh, Christian's very interesting findings on measuring IR. Um, could you pick up any common denominator for the best performers? Um, and they ask here whether it could be collective agreements, structures of labor markets, company level relations. You, you referred in part to that, but would you have any, I suppose, insights into what could be the the, the, the things at play for the best performers. Okay. Well, like I mentioned, we have this industrial democracy index, which is again subcomposed uh, into 13 indicators. And they're not very surprising, but they're interesting. Well, what are the common numbers? Probably the best performance in all those 13, which is high trade union and employer density, high collective bargaining, uh, right to associ association. Mm -hmm quality of social dialogue at company level measured by our own survey, the EWCS, and workers' rights, uh, board level representation measured by ETUC, uh, the right to strike, um, the right to, I mentioned this, uh, freedom of association, and the ratification of core labor standards. So this is the package mm -hmm. of 13 indicators, 
which then leads to, if, if you perform well, a good result yeah. in industrial democracy. And then we have all the color relations I just mentioned before. So I think that's a bit the structure of the whole exercise. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, uh, other questions, there's um, uh, a, a slightly more complicated one here. I'll maybe come back to it in a moment. Uh, but just in a question which was raised by Elizabeth at an earlier stage was about a social dialogue and how can it contribute to to the work around tackling the green transition? I mean, we have, you know, COP is just uh, closing today, uh, very much on the agenda for everyone. I just transition very much to the fore of everything going on in, in the European agenda, the Green Deal. Um, you know, do you have ideas as to how social dialogue could be a useful tool in tackling this? Well, we have ideas, but of course, I, mean, I guess that also governments and, and social partners, they also have their own ideas. What we have seen so far in our research is that uh, the, the level of contribution of dialogue to, to the green transition, to the uh, green deal, to other, in, in general speaking, to the um, green policies that are needed to be met in, in, in a very short period of time. It's, um, it's has a lot of room to improve, to say mm -hmm. so. so uh, first of all, uh, of course, certainly in some, in some member states, uh, there are some steps that have been done in terms of, uh, for example, all the work around the just transition in order mm -hmm. to facilitate the, the shift from uh, the coal mines, for example, to other uh, economic um, uh, performance. Um, this is taking place, so there's this funding about that, uh, and we, we have seen and uh, we have found uh, different agreements, uh, social dialogue, mm -hmm. of course, outcomes, but it still needs to be uh, much more spread out. Um, for example, uh, at sectoral level, we have seen some joint declarations, statements, etc., but only in some sectors, um, but really in some sectors, for example, in the energy sector, it was quite, quite, quite important. So we have seen these this developments, but still in a very early stages. Uh, for example, in collective bargaining, uh, there are some, not many, just a few uh, provisions in order to facilitate say, the, the green transition. This much more uh, focus on the on the governance of the green transition than on specific measures mm -hmm. in order to facilitate this thing. So there is a lot of uh, space of room in order to to include the the, the 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 green transition aspects in collective bargaining, in social dialogue at all levels. And this is something that uh, is, is a pending issue for social dialogue as such. Also, of course, governments must facilitate uh, the, the, these spaces for negotiation, these spaces for, 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 for having social dialogue contributing to, to it. That's, um, of course, there's some, some barriers. So, uh, honestly speaking, if you ask, for example, in collective bargaining now, with, with the, the high impact of uh, uh, inflation, mm -hmm. uh, that is a little focusing on wage negotiation and, for example, to include green transition aspects in a collective bargaining is not so easy. And sure. we can understand that. But really, that's a short vision, short-term vision. And I think that social partners, and of course, governments, particularly social partners, need to have this medium and long vision term for, for including a green transition because really it's probably the most relevant aspect that we, we have it in the challenge mm -hmm. ahead, as we have seen in the, one of the, in the COP. Absolutely, the, one of the major the challenges facing us uh, today, clearly. Um, and if I may, if I yeah, may something, ahead. because so something that is related to the, the why it's not more spread out is because probably something that we have mentioned before, the, the, the capacity, mm -hmm. the capacity mm -hmm. is in green transition and all the circular economy, the carbonization aspect, are complicated issues mm -hmm. are, are, are relatively new in the in the world of, of labor, at least in some sectors, not in others. And of course, that's some some investment in terms of uh, uh, building capacity in, in this aspect are totally necessary for both social partners. So it's first of all in terms of awareness, but also in terms of uh, capacity, technical capacity, in order to understand what are the implications of the real transition for this specific sector, for this specific company. That is something that we should be. Uh, to work on it. Focusing on, okay. I mean, following up a little bit, there's a, a question here from Anna Kay, uh, who is asking you, uh, Christian, specifically, 
Do you have any thoughts as to, I and mean, clearly, I don't think we have research specifically on this, but perhaps your own uh, ideas as to how trade unions can become more attractive for these millennials? Well, for that's this is the going on your, your vast expertise. <laughs> Time and again. Um, it's the usual stuff, uh, being more active on social media, et cetera, et cetera, what you could, could give it as an answer. Mm -hmm. But uh, I really don't. It's a difficult task. If I had the answer, um, I probably wouldn't be standing here. <laughs> no, unfortunately not. And some things won't change. We have those more precarious employment relationships. We have the platform work. We have uh, other more less permanent structures. And we will have artificial intelligence mm -hmm. in the future. So I think um, this question is going to become more acute and it's likely to be solved, unfortunately. But I suppose one of the questions that would be good for us to be able to answer, perhaps feeding into that, would be when you look at, you know, the industrial relations systems, and you said there, you know, you have strong industrial relations systems that like, has a correlation with other mm -hmm. very positive uh, dimensions. Uh, you also referred to the positive um, uh, experience of the pandemic in terms of you know the input from from, from the social dialogue perspective. Um, what what could we outline as maybe you know a success story that you could put on the table as being something that you know could be a takeaway that it's it's worthwhile that could encourage participation in this process. Well. First of all, we have some data on that, so they are not representative data, but we have the, the, the policy watch, which is one of the uh, databases that we have in Eurofound, and we were collecting um, policy measures that were adopted in 20 and 2021. Well, we are still collecting that, but uh, data from these uh, two, two years, basically from the very beginning of the pandemic outbreak, uh, show that um, of the more than 1,000 uh, policy measures, mm -hmm. legislation, agreements, whatever, uh, taken uh, in, in that period of time, 40% um, approximately were uh, social partners were involved. Mm -hmm. Both meaning not only being informed, but also being consulted. Uh, sometimes or even some, well, there was an agreement, a preacher agreement behind this. But, this, this, the, the figures show that, and in this specific period of time, there was really a willing to engage in something that was very, very important at, at that time. Um, success stories. There are some examples. Um, we can, we can some examples in terms of that time in Italy, in Spain, some some um, very new uh, tripartite agreements in order to sort out this problem. I would say at this stage uh, that. Of course, we can have some example, but that, that, that we don't have to do that. But I will say something about that. So, uh, on the negative side, basically, uh, something that we have also seen, we still see in the um, in social dialogue, in tripartite national social dialogue, basically, is that um, uh, changes in government uh, are impacting the quality of social dialogue. We have seen in some countries. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not going to to, sure. to, yeah. to to blame, but we see that it, sometimes it happens that there is a new government and the, the quality really down a lot. So and, and just the opposite side. So I think that uh, it's very important to have a, a regular and stable, uh, at least uh, social dialogue framework mm -hmm. and practices. Uh, that even if you don't agree on anything, mm -hmm. it's okay. But at least to keep to keep going to keep this part. So that's uh, an important lesson. Um, if, if I may also have time, so I think that we have also uh, to mention something very important in order for, for social dialogue, which has been the European semester. Uh, we, Christian and I, were studying that uh, at the very beginning, and uh, it's true that uh, it was established in 2010, 2011, after the three recession uh, instruments for macroeconomic coordination, uh, until the, the 2016, really, we did it 2016, 17, with the European Pillar of Social Rights at that time, with the, 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 the new restart of social dialogue, we started to see some uh, social uh, aspects in the in the management of the uh, of the European semester, which has been, which it is really the the very the most important macroeconomic 
coordination uh, instrument in the European Union. And more than that, because now with the uh, next generation and the recovery and resilience yeah. facility has also been integrated in the European semester. So, and that means that social partners must be consulted there, must be informed. So, uh, mm -hmm. it's, so these are very important developments on the ground sure. for national social dialogue. And then this is something that we, that we say, okay, social dialogue has improved over time, mm -hmm. fortunately, but still room for improvement. Yeah. yeah. And that's a very point, a important point that you make about the the tenor, the power of the government in place having such a critical uh, role in terms of encouraging or facilitating or not uh, social dialogue, particularly in the run up to the European elections that we have coming in, in 2024. And we should all keep that in mind. Did you want to add to that, uh, Christian? Yes, uh, yeah. again, going back one question for me and uh, being the uh, advocate of CW for a second. You can also have a strong IR with low trade union density. In France, for example, mm -hmm. France has one of the lowest trade union densities in Europe, mm -hmm. but via a special mechanism of extension of collective agreements, you have a very high, one of the highest collective bargain coverage in Europe. So there's also that twist mm -hmm. to it. So the picture is really complicated. Success story. Mm -hmm. uh, again, going back in time, definitely a long way back in time, Val Duchesse. When Delors came to power in, in 85, uh, his big project was uh, to relaunch the common market. He uh, smartly uh, entrusted this to a British uh, commissioner, Lord Cofield, coming up with all the things that don't work. This became the white book. And then there were those who argued, well, that's something for business. And then the commission had this very smart idea of gathering the social partners around the Valdezas, the Priory in Odegem, and then after many, many years of negotiations, they came up with agreement on social dialogue as we have it right now. So it was actually the social partners themselves who wrote these articles, which are now Article 154 and 155 of the TFU. That's a great success story in terms of structures. In terms of outcome, the first agreement they signed was the agreement of, on parental leave, mm. uh, revised in 2009. Uh, we would not have a subjective right to parental leave in Ireland, if it hadn't been for this agreement in 1969. Well, that's certainly a, a success story, speaking uh, as a beneficiary of the parental leave. So um, I am going to move to, to you both uh, for your sort of big takeaway that you'd like to leave for the audience uh, before we leave today. Um, we have about eight minutes left. But I will suppose leave you with one question which came in also on an issue which clearly is at the core of integrating, as you were talking about earlier, the whole process of European social dialogue into the social model, that it is a fundamental critical element of embedded in the European social model. And the question here is, you know, to what extent do the disputes that we see in companies uh, such as Twitter, formerly Twitter, now X, uh, and Tesla with their European workforce show that there's a cultural gap uh, between American companies and that European approach, the mm. European social model. Would you like to take that, uh, Christian? Yeah, uh, there certainly is uh, this cultural gap, uh, especially here uh, in <laughs> Ireland, if I may say. Uh, we'll see how this bears out, but uh, what we would expect or could expect is that those companies adhere to the European social model, which means strong voice mm. for the employees, either by works or by the trade unions or both. Uh, I think there are interesting times to come. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah. So that's, if I may, of because course. we have published uh, before summertime, um, was an article in our website about precisely the um, industrial labor relations in those uh, um, big tech companies, for mm -hmm. example, in, Qatar, in, in the European Union. Because precisely at the beginning of this year, we saw all this uh, massive lace off Lay in, yeah, in yeah, many yeah. things, and, and in, in most of these companies in the European Union, mm. and they don't have any uh, works council or any representation. So, sure. but um, so it's true that it is uh, happening now, and the European Social Club, we have also seen now problems in Sweden, in Germany, with uh, a very important company <laughs> standing there. And that's part of the, as you said before, part of the European social model, but it's not only a declaration, mm -hmm. this is in practice. And we have shown in our research, so those countries with a strong and regular and stable social dialogue, um, industrial relations, uh, uh, they are the most competitive in the end. So, social dialogue, good social dialogue, it's good for 
social market economy. That's a win-win. For social market economy, for social resilience, and for competitiveness. Mm -hmm. That's the, the lesson that we, we know. That for sounds like years. your takeaway. Yeah. Could Is be. that your takeaway? Oh, sorry, not takeaway. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Christian, do you want to, to, oh, to leave to, us with uh, to, a pearl of wisdom? To add anything, but I'll just reiterate, because this project, the last one has shown it, uh, it has shown that in a system of good and mature industrialisations, it is possible to combine efficiency, equity, and voice. Uh, for this to happen, you need strong autonomous social partners with sufficient capacities, you need trust, but you also need a supportive government supportive legal framework. If you don't have this, it's difficult with social partners. And for all this, I think we are, we are as your found or your as your found, you're well placed to help this process to become better and to have good quality destinations, even those countries where it's a bit far from perfect right now. Well, thank you, Christian, and thank you, Ricardo, today. Uh, trust, capacity, and the support of government are things that we've heard consistently over the last hour. Thank you all very much for your questions and for your dynamic interaction and participation with today's discussion. As has been referenced a couple of times by, by both colleagues here, all of the information and research that you have heard them discuss today is available on our website. You can download any of the reports. You can ask, access any of the podcasts, Eurofan Talks. You can look at previous webinars, uh, Eurofan Live, et cetera, which are also available online. And also I direct you to the EU Policy Watch, which uh, Ricardo referenced earlier, which does give you a um, vast amount of information on different excuse me, policy initiatives uh, by social partners and governments across the European Union during the period of time of the pandemic and then on through uh, to today. So uh, we have all of this information available. If there are further queries or questions that you might have, either for uh, Ricardo or Christian, I know Christian will still be available for a little time to, to provide his, his feedback and expertise. Please don't hesitate to contact us at Eurofound. Um, and we hope that you continue to follow us, to subscribe, to join up and listen in for our next webinar, uh, where we will hope we will hear from you all again. In the meantime, thank you very much for joining us and I wish you a good afternoon.